So this uh, presentation, we're going to focus on the Dinkle era, and that is about 1880 to 1918. Uh, through some of the narrative, we'll be following the actual first person account of William Mansfield Dinkle, known as the Daddy of Carbondale. And we'll intersperse his story with other people and events important to the formation and development of the town of Carbondale. Research material was derived from various personal accounts and recorded histories, including a history of the Northern Ute people by Fred A. Konata, Dinkle, Pioneer of the Roaring Fork by Iva Dunkley, Carbondale Pioneers, 1879 to 1890 by Edna Denmark Sweet, one of our most valuable resource materials, Roaring Fork Valley by Len Shoemaker and archives of the Carbondale Historical Society. And photos came from the Carbondale Historical Society, Colorado Historical Society, Denver Library, Aspen Historical Society, and of course, the web. Um, some of the pictures might be a little blurry because I did steal them off the web. So <laughs> just know that uh, that's not very professional, but that's how I put this slideshow together. Um, much of this material on Dinkle was contributed by his great-granddaughter, Shelley DeBeck, who still lives here in the Valley. So we'll begin with Mr. Dinkle's story. My story began on a plantation in Bridgewater, Virginia, where I was born on October 14, 1847, and lived the pleasant but dull life of a gentleman farmer until the age of 33. My siblings and I had known only comfort in our youth, and when we heard about the newly opened gold mining territory in the West, it seemed a delightful adventure. So in 1880, my brother James and I, with high hopes, bade a cheerful goodbye to kinsfolk and set off to seek our fortune in the Rocky Mountains. We reached Pueblo, Colorado in February 1881, where we heard a bit of gossip as to the lack of flour in the silver mining town of Aspen on the other side of the Continental Divide. Seeing an opportunity to improve our financial situation, we packed our mules and horses with 800 pounds of flour and set off over the mountains. The journey was a most difficult undertaking on the steep grade through deep snow. The weather was intensely cold. When we were within 200 feet of the top of the pass, one of the mules fell down. Owing to the hazardous position on the edge of a precipice, there was nothing could be done but cut the harness. The poor beast slipped over the edge into a bank of snow half a mile below and was buried. We stood aghast at the sight. A sorry sight we made trudging into Aspen, men and beasts heavily laden with flour. We had paid $32 a 50 pound sack in Pueblo and offered the price at 400 a sack in Aspen. The merchants balked at the price, but when the demanding public found out there was flour in town, the price was given without quibbling. My brother James, and having become smitten with a young debutante, stayed back, but I met another prospector, Bob Zimmerman, who was keen to see the gold fields of Montana Territory. So we traveled down the Roaring Fork Valley, through the Ute Reservation, and on to Grand River, known to you as the Colorado, where Glenwood Springs now lies. When we arrived at the now famous hot spring, I threw my clothes aside, happily anticipating the comfort to come. With my first plunge, I thought I was to be boiled alive. I had entered at the point where the spring comes out of the ground. Desperately, I lunged away, and it was 600 feet distant before the water cooled off to a bearable temperature. After camping on the Mesa north of the Colorado River, we continued northeast through Indian territory. One morning, we were met by a party of four or five Indians. We tried to explain that we weren't homesteaders and were just passing through on our way to Montana, but they made it clear we had to leave the reservation and turn back. Perhaps it was the famous Ute warrior Colorado who turned Dinkle and Zimmerman away from the Ute territory. In the late 1870s, Tuop Wheats, or Colorado, as he became to, came to be known, and his friend Pia, police the reservation against non-Ute settlers. In this role, Colorado, with his unusually large size, struck fear into the settlers who were trying to homestead the reservation land. He put his index finger in the dirt and warned, Ute's dirt, one sleep, you go. 
The Ute tribe was comprised of 12 related but separate groups, encompassing much of the territory that became Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico. They called themselves Nusha, meaning the people. The Spanish, having first encountered the Uinta group, mistakenly called all Nusha Utahs or Utes. The people of the Central Rockies were the Tabiwash and the Padianush. The Tabiwash traditional homeland was the area of the Gunnison River south of McClure Pass. In 1856, when they visited the Taos Agency, Indian agent Kit Carson estimated them to number from 10 to 1,200. The Padianusha, meaning elk people, inhabited the Grand Valley where Grand Junction is now. The Utes called the Rockies the Shining Mountains. The Ute did not farm or keep livestock. They followed the cycle of the seasons, moving to deserts and valleys during the winter and to mountains in the summer, returning to familiar areas year after year. In spring, they traveled in family bands through the Crystal and Roaring Fork Valleys to the Upper Colorado and Yampa Rivers, hunting, fishing, and gathering plants for food and medicine. They traveled by horse, which they probably acquired in the late 1600s from their friendly southern neighbors, the Hickoria Apache. The Utes prized their horses above all of other possessions, as they allowed them to travel long distances, hunting big game and carrying their belongings on the long summer migrations. They also used their horses for fun, particularly racing and gambling. The family was the center of the Ute life. Each member had certain duties. Grandmothers taught young girls how to tan hides, make baskets, do beadwork, and gather seeds and berries. Grandfathers taught young boys how to chip, chip flint into arrowheads, how to track animals, and how to catch fish. Parents and young adults provided for the material well being of the group. Women gathered and prepared fo food, sewed and repaired clothing and shelters, hauled wood and carried water and prepared medicines. Men hunted and fished, made ropes, bows and arrows, and read the stars and geography of the land while traveling the large circuit of their nomadic territory. When the summer migration was happening, many bands would gather for the bear dance where women would choose their dancing partners, many of whom soon became their husbands. When fur trappers began arriving in the early 1800s, they were met with trust and friendliness by the Utes, who established profitable trade relations with them. The 1830s was a period of prosperity. Ute women were renowned for producing the softest, softest deer hides and beautiful beadwork. The Utes traded the hides of elk, deer, sheep, and buffalo for weapons, ammunition, blankets, utensils, and exchanged beaded apparel for Western clothing and trinkets. In May 1859, a rich vein of gold-bearing quartz was discovered on the South Platte River near the present site of Denver. Thousands of Easterners traveled to gold country to mine and settle on Ute lands. Friction developed and some of the miners and Utes were killed in fights between them. In 1863, another massive influx of settlers occurred after gold was discovered in the Pikes Peak region. Thousands more people traveled to the gold country, some with their families intending to settle there in violation of Indian rights since no treaty had been signed with the Ute people giving up this land. The invasion was causing havoc. The settlers cleared the land of natural foliage and killed or drove out the game that the Utes depended on for their survival. War was only narrowly averted. In October of 1863, a council was set to negotiate a treaty. Ten Ute leaders, including Colorado and Ure, signed the treaty, ceding more land to the U.S. government for mining and homesteading. Ure was not a tribal leader, but he could speak several languages, so he was chosen by the U.S. government to represent the Ute people. In return for ceding some of their land for settlement and mining, the Utes were to be given cattle, sheep, horses, provisions, houses, and equi equipment, and blacksmiths, all of which had been promised in earlier treaties and never delivered. Again, the United States failed to provide these payments. Central Colorado had been reserved for the Ute people in 1863, but when more miners poured in, followed by farmers and ranchers, 
conflicts prompted further negotiations with the U.S. government. In 1868, Ute leaders signed a treaty giving them 16 million acres of Western Colorado lands for their absolute and undisturbed use and occupation. In exchange for giving the rest of their land to the US, the Utes were to receive schools, teachers, a sawmill, blacksmiths, clothing, blankets, food, cows, and sheep, which as usual, never materialized. In the 1870s, William Jackson and Ferdinand Hayden were commissioned by the U.S. government to perform geological surveys of the Rocky Mountains. Jackson, Jackson's photographs and Hayden's maps did much to publicize the West, including the lands here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Hayden's survey, published in 1878, highlighted numerous potential mining sites, including some around Aspen. Aspen was technically Indian territory, prospectors had not ventured into the area until Hayden's report. Hayden's geological map identified geology in the Aspen area that was similar to that of Leadville, which was experiencing both a gold and silver boom. Using the survey as a map, prospectors crossed over the Continental Divide into Ashcroft and Aspen, which for a brief time was known as Ute City. The U.S. government established agencies to administer the funds received for feeding and housing and clothing the Indians. The agents were also supposed to encourage the Indians to farm and ranch, since the U people were not allowed guns and ammunition with which to hunt. Under the provisions of the 1868 treaty, an Indian, Indian agency was established on the White River Reservation for the Padianush, our Roaring Fork Valley Elk people, Yampa and Uinta bands, who all became known as the White River Utes and later the Uncompagre Utes. In the spring of 1878, Nathan Meeker was appointed as Indian agent to the White River Agency. Meeker did not have the right temperament to work with the Ute people. He treated them like bad children and punished them when they would not do as he ordered. He would withhold food for long periods of time, resulting in near starvation. When Meeker dis, when Meeker dis, oh, sorry about that. When Meeker discovered that some of the Utes were using their land to pasture their horses for racing rather than farming, he ordered his employees to plow the land, causing a minor rebellion. Then Meeker suggested that the Utes shoot some of their ponies because they had too many to feed. Upon this outrageous suggestion, one of the Utes grabbed Meeker and threw him to the ground. Fearing violence, Meeker sent for military aid, but the troops were ambushed by a band of Utes at Milk Creek resulting in six days of fighting in which men on both sides were killed and wounded. The battle at Milk Creek enraged and emboldened the Utes at the White River Agency, who felt that Meeker had betrayed them. They killed Meeker and seven of his male employees. They took Mrs. Meeker, her daughter Josephine, along with another woman and her children captive. The cavalry pursued them and the Utes eventually stopped fighting and released their captives. But news of the incident shocked the country. It was called the Meeker Massacre. The Utes prefer to call it the Meeker Incident. Many bills were presented in Congress to either move the Utes from Colorado or to confine them all to the White River area. After an investigation of the situation, the War Department Department established a military post to discipline and control the Utes. The reservation was located at Fort Duchesne in the barren desert lands of Eastern Utah. The US Army rounded up the Northern Utes and force marched them out of Colorado. By 1881, all of Colorado's Northern Ute people had been removed. Colorado took up the tail end of the exodus, the Utes trip of sorrow. In the early 2000s, Efforts were made to invite the descendants of the Northern Ute back into their traditional hunting summer lands here in the Crystal and Roaring Fork Valleys. Clifford Duncan, a Ute elder, made many trips here, teaching and performing sacred ceremonies. In honor of the first people, the town of Carbondale renamed Turnbull Park, Nusha Park. It's located near the fish hatchery on Highway 133, south of town. For a first-person account of Ute life, go to the, our website, 
called uh, carbondalehistory.org and go to the historic women page, click on Clara Rose. Clara Rose is voiced by Charlotte Graham Whitney and it is a first person account of a woman's life as a youth um, in this period, time period that we're talking about. Now the land was opened up in the Roaring Fork and Crystal Valleys to miners and homesteaders, which brings us back to Mr. Dinkle's story. After being turned back by the Indians, we traveled south until we came to what was then known as Rock Creek, later named the Crystal River. At the confluence of the Roaring Fork River, which had been named for the Ute translation of Thunder River, the majestic Mount Sopris presided over the southern end of the valley, so called for Captain Richard Sopris, who led the first regiment of Colorado volunteers through the Elk Mountain Range in the 1860s. At the time we arrived at the site of his namesake mountain, Sopris was the mayor of Denver. It was August, 1881, about 30 days prior to the opening of the Ute Reservation to American settlement when we arrived in the Crystal Valley. We found already living in the area, Bill Gant, the trapper, and prospectors, E.F. Prince, Myron and Alex Thompson, George and Joseph Ewell, and George and John Thomas. The prospecting wasn't yielding much success for these men, but the valley had the appearance of making fine agricultural country. So Zimmerman and I decided on a change of plans. We purchased a span of mules and harnesses and set ourselves up as the first agriculturists, agriculturalists in the valley in the spring of 1882. We plowed and planted 12 acres, eight in oats, two in potatoes, one in onions, and one to beans, peas, and other vegetables, and built the first irrigation ditch out of the Roaring Fork River. Then in the summer of 1884, we built the first stagecoach stop in the valley on the toll road from Aspen to Glenwood, built by Jerome Wheeler, now Catherine Store Road. Dinkles became the hobnobbing point for commercial travelers and the meeting place of local farmers after work. And now diverting from Dinkle for a bit. By 1884, families had started to arrive in the Crystal and Roaring Fork Valleys. According to the Homestead Act signed by President Abraham Lincoln on May 20th, 1862, an applicant could claim title to up to 160 acres of undeveloped federal land outside the original 13 colonies. Harvey Tanney, homesteading on the land north of the present town site of Carbondale, had applied for and secured a post office in 1883 and became the first postmaster. Post offices were usually named for the town in which they were located, but at the time there was no town. So Tanny chose the name Satank for a defiant Kiowa chief he much admired. Tanny was killed in an accident in 1884 and Mrs. Ottawa Tanny became postmistress. She acquired the land where Carbondale now sits along the stage road and built an eating house for the stage passengers. She located the post office there also. In anticipation of two railroads, the Denver and Rio Grande and the Crystal River and San Juan, meeting at the confluence of the Roaring Fork and Crystal Rivers, Isaac Cooper, one of the founders of Glenwood Springs, bought the land there. He and fellow landowner Fred Childs began laying out the town site of Cooperton, which was to include a railroad station and post office. Since the Satank post office was already operating on the stage road about a mile east, Cooper and Childs petitioned Ottawa Tanny to let them move it to Cooperton. She agreed and the post office was relocated. Cooperton was already being populated by young pioneer families. It had a school, a saloon, and a stage stop. A hotel was under construction and plans were made to build a train station that would cement the town of Cooperton as the crossroads between Aspen, Glenwood Springs, and Redstone. But negotiations between Cooper and the railroad tycoons fell through and they were persuaded to locate their station in the settlement a mile east where Dinkle, Tanny, and others already had their businesses. A bitter fight ensued over the location of the post office. Cooperton was derisively called Yellow Dog 
by the residents of the Eastern Settlement, which was eventually called Hogmore by the Cooperton residents. Despite Cooper and Child's best efforts, the Satank Post Office was once more relocated to the Eastern Settlement. And when in 1887, Cooper suddenly died at the age of 48, the town of Cooperton died with him. The name Satank stuck with the area though, and that is the name by which the neighborhood is still known today. It remains a defiant outlier, having never been incorporated into the town of Carbondale. It is, a, it is Garfield County territory. The town of Carbondale was incorporated in 1888 and named for the hometown in Pennsylvania of Ellery Johnson, one of the town site's surveyors. Back to Dinkle's story. In 1885, Zimmerman and I cut logs from the slopes of Mount Sopris and built for business on the main thoroughfare, an eight room house, a barn to shelter 60 head of horses, a store 16 by 25 feet and opened the first inn in the valley. Coal mining had become the principal enterprise of the area. The mines operated for the person purpose of fueling the silver smelters and steam engines. My business at Carbondale was increased very much by the men who came down from the coal mines on the weekends to trade. Oftentimes we sold them a thousand dollars worth of goods on a Saturday night. I opened a small store at Spring Gulch Mining Camp and provided mail delivery to the miners and their families. Since most of the people in the camps were recent immigrants, from Austria and Italy, the man I sent to deliver the mail had a hard time making out their names. So when he'd show up in camp, everyone would gather around and he'd empty the bag on the ground. Chaos and much laughter would ensue as the crowd dove in to retrieve their mail. Those were days of plenty for the men and families of the Crystal Valley. Money flowed down from the mines like water. I founded the Bank of Carbondale in 1888 to service the miners, farmers, and entrepreneurs. It was located in the building Zimmerman and I had built at the east end of town and was started with the help of capital from one of our well-to-do community members, Mary Jane Francis. Mary Jane, or MJ, was a wealthy widow from New England. She came to the Crystal Valley in 1882 and traveled by horse to look over mining claims she'd acquired. She fell in love with the area and bought land south of town. Her nephew, Harry Van Sickle, helped run the mining operations while MJ developed her land in Carbondale. She built a luxurious ranch home, which she named Vita Wee. She made quite a sight traveling around town in her shiny black spring wagon, drawn by a team of matched black horses and driven by a coachman in uniform. Mary Jane was well loved in the community for her philanthropy. She donated some of her land to build both the Methodist Church and the Carbondale School. MJ died in 1914 at the age of 78. And we were all very surprised to learn that she had been secretly married for the past 33 years to her nephew, Harry Van Sickle, a man 23 years her junior. She left her $4 million fortune to Van Sickle, who continued to live in the Carbondale community. In November 1891, a fierce fire consumed many of the buildings in the east end of town, including mine. But the bank safe was rescued from the burning building and wheeled down the street to my new two-story brick building at 4th and Main Street, where the bank was open for business the next day. The building occupied an entire block and housed the bank, post office, a hotel, and the Dinkle Mercantile Company. Our store had the reputation of carrying as choice groceries as could be found. We furnished French mushrooms, pâté de foie gras, choice cheese, the finest coffees and cigars. If Dinkles didn't have what you wanted, we'd order it for you. Why, Hattie Holland furnished nearly the entirety of her grand estate from my store. And now we go to the story of the Thompson Holland family. The grand estate Dinkle refers to is what we now know as the Thompson House Museum, but it started out with humble roots. 
In the mid 1870s, Myron Thompson left his wife Almira and children in Missouri and came to, the, came to Colorado with his son Alex in search of gold and silver. They ended up in the Crystal Valley in 1880 and settled on a creek south of what would eventually become Carbondale. That creek is now known as Thompson Creek and Myron's descendants, the Sewell brothers, still live there on the Sunfire Ranch. The Utes still hunted in the valley then and Myron and Alex lived peacefully with them. When in 1881, the land was opened up to homesteading, the Thompsons filed claims and began farming, having given up on prospecting. In 1881, Myron went back to Missouri to bring his family west. Elmira had passed away and his older children were on their own. So Myron brought his five youngest children to the Crystal Valley. His daughter, Hattie Bell Thompson, was 15 years old. Samuel Bowles came from Missouri and was homesteading to the north of Thompson Land. Sam's nephew, Oscar Holland, arrived in 1881, having been told by his doctor that the dry Colorado air would be good for his tuberculosis. Oscar filed a claim on the land north of his uncle Bowles. Together, Sam and Oscar, along with neighbor Myron Thompson, built cabins, fences, and barns. Oscar eventually bought his uncle Sam's land, and Sam bought some property in the Redstone area. He brought his wife, Sarah, and their children here from Missouri in the mid-1880s. They had many more children and grandchildren whose descendants are now scattered far and wide. It's likely that Oscar and Myron's daughter, Hattie, might have begun courting at this time. In 1885, Oscar asked Myron to begin constructing a home for him, probably intending to ask for Hattie's hand in marriage. But in 1886, when Hattie was 18, she suddenly ran off to Aspen and married Aspen attorney, Charles Jones. A little over a year later, Jones divorced Hattie, who did not show up for the hearing. She married Oscar Holland the same month her divorce was final. Something going on there. Hattie and Oscar moved into the single story brick home built by her father and began building their fortune in agriculture. They grew hay, oats, and barley and raised sheep and cattle. They called their property Pleasant View Ranch, and as their fortune grew, so did the size of their spread, eventually totaling 1,200 acres. A second story was added to the house in 1895. A third remodel enlarged and enclosed the French front porch. The home was one of the first to have electricity in 1911 and to be hooked up to city water. The Holland home was the setting of many parties that, according to the newspapers, lasted into the morning. The list of participants show that Hattie and Oscar hosted not only their extended families, but guests from all over the Crystal and Roaring Fork River Valleys, Missouri Heights, and Aspen. And the news, newspaper article here says that dancing continued until six in the morning when breakfast was served, after which the finishing dances were had. Some party. In 1920, Oscar died by self-inflicted gunshot wound. As you can see by the uh, obituary, he shot himself in the left lung. We surmise that his illness, tuberculosis, was causing him a lot of pain, and that's why he took his own life. At his death, the Rifle Telegram Re Revelé newspaper stated that Oscar, the vice president of the Bank of Carbondale, was worth $250,000. At the age of 54, Hattie Holland found herself a wealthy but childless widow. She took her husband's place on the board of directors at the Bank of Carbondale, and with the help of her ranch manager, Jim Leggett, continued to run the ranch. When Hattie desired to travel, Leggett ran the business and updated her with regular letters. Hattie and her traveling companion, Sally, drove to Yellowstone National Park in a Cleveland Roadster. It's unknown who the car belonged to and virtually nothing is known about the mysterious Sally, not even her last name. In 1927, at the age of 61, Hattie purchased a passport and began to travel by steamship and train. She went to Europe, Morocco, 
Hong Kong. And in Egypt, she visited the tomb of King Tut, which had just been discovered. She brought back furniture and collectibles that could be seen in the house today, including a replica Taj Mahal from her travels to India. And as you can see, she fudged her age there a little bit on her passport. During one of her trips, she met Edward Tiffin and married him. For some inexplicable reason, she started going by the name Susie. Ed's letters are addressed this way, and so are many others she received from friends during that time. Tiffin lived in Missouri and was unwilling to move to Colorado. Addie, also unwilling to move, was also unwilling, so their relationship was maintained through letter writing. We only have Ed's letters, of course, since he received hers, and they started out romantic, but show a progressive trend toward irreconcilable differences, mainly due to Hattie's refusal to invest her money in his real estate dealings. Hattie traveled to Missouri to petition the court for divorce, but Ed did not appear at the hearing. In the petition, she asked that her name be restored to Hattie Holland. In 1934, Hattie had a stroke that left her incapacitated. She asked her nephew, Lewis Thompson, for help with her personal care and with management of the ranch. She told him she, he would inherit the ranch, so he agreed to move his family from Palisade to the Crystal Valley. Lewis and his wife, Jewel, and their four children lived in a cabin on the ranch. The family not only managed the ranch, but also cooked, cared, and cleaned for Hattie. In 1944, at age 77, Hattie died of a massive stroke. As promised, Hattie gave the house and land to her nephew, Lewis, who continued ranching until his death in 1990. The land and house was then passed down to Lewis and Jewel's four children. As with many family ranches in the area, over time, parcels were sold off to private buyers or developers for housing tracks. In 2010, the Thompson House descendants sold most of the remaining Pleasant View Ranch property to a developer. That developer, seeing the value of retaining the historic house, gave it and the land gave it and the land it sits on to the town of Carbondale. Yes, a developer gave up land, which turned the property into the Thompson House History Park at the corner of Louise Lane and Jewel Court, named for Lewis and Jewel Thompson. The contents of the Thompson House which constitutes all of Hattie's belongings and furnishings when she died in 1944, were donated by the Thompson family to the Historical Society. The town and the Historical Society manage the House, house Museum in partnership. The house is on the National Register of Historic Places. You can learn more about the Holland and Thompson family history on the new River Valley Ranch History Trail a series of signs explaining the heritage of the land that used to be Pleasant View Ranch. The signs are due to be installed this summer. Meanwhile, back to Mr. Dinkle. To furnish fresh meat for the Dinkle Mercantile, I and my partners, Frank Sweet and Lafayette Fate Gerdner, bought land on the East Mesa and started the Big Four Ranch. We divided our duties thus. Gerdner ran the cattle ranch, Sweet ran the mercantile and I ran the bank. I also served as Carbondale's mayor from 1889 to 1991. In 1892, when I was 44, I married my childhood sweetheart, Sally Angeline Dunlap, who was then working as a Kansas school teacher. I built her a nice home on the land at the south end of town, which I'd purchased from Mary Jane Francis. But Sally was a sophisticated and learned woman from my home state of Virginia, and she did not take well to the rough frontier town of Carbondale. So she was delighted when I was elected to two terms as a representative of Garfield County in the state legislature in 1900 and in 1902. And we lived in Denver those four years. But the luxuries of city life made returning to my beloved home in Carbondale a woeful experience for my wife. So I resolved to ease her discomfort in any way I could. In the first decade of the new century, Carbondale's residents were relying on the regular deliveries of water wagons. 
I and several others formed a committee to channel water from Nettle Creek on the slopes of Mount Sopris, nine miles to town. In 1910, we brought in the first load of pipe for the new system. The pipe was made of wood staves bound together by iron coils. Now my lovely wife could water her gardens and all of Carbondale began to bloom. A group of prominent women had started the Carbondale Study Club, and in addition to discussing important issues and literature, they conducted special projects for the community. It was the study club that orchestrated planting trees along Main Street and beautified the cemetery on White Hill. Sally suffering under the primitive condition of candles and oil lamps and without benefit of the new modern electrical household devices, finally made me enter negotiations with the Shoshone Power Company to bring electricity to Carbondale from the hydroelectric plant on the Colorado River. With great difficulty and much expense, Carbondale Power and Light finally turned on the electricity in 1911. Carbondale's population at the time was only 300 people and the cost of electricity was the highest in the nation. Now our little town had all the modern comforts and continued to thrive despite the ups and downs of the mining and agricultural industries. As the coal mining industry faltered due to the decreased demand once silver was devalued, agriculture became Carbondale's major enterprise. It was discovered that potatoes being native to the high mountains of South America were also finally suited to Colorado's mountains. My good friend, Eugene Grubb wrote in his book, The Potato, the Roaring Fork and Crystal River Valley section of Colorado is as nearly perfect in soil conditions as can be found. And the potatoes grown there are not excelled anywhere in the world. In the fall, when the potatoes had been harvested, farmers brought them to town by the wagon loads to sell and be put on trains for commercial markets. The families would dress up in their finest and the whole town would have a three-day celebration. This Potato Day tradition began in 1909 with a community barbecue lunch, games, contests, and an evening dance. Contests included a married women's race, fattest baby, and garden vegetable judging, as well as commercial potato contests. As the commercial potato industry in Carbondale grew, it was necessary to form a potato brokerage so that our farmers could get a good price on their crops from the buyers in the railroad dining car, restaurant and hotel business. The brokerage was naturally located in my Dinkle building where I built a freight elevator to carry the loads of potato sacks to the basement storage area until the time when they would be raised and loaded onto trains for transportation to the east and west coasts and everywhere in between. In 1915, I was considered a successful merchant, broker, banker, and community leader. A far cry from when I arrived with barely a nickel to my name. Sally and I had one child, Margaret Ann. She married Wallace DeBeck II, who was the son of the founder of the town of DeBeck in Western Colorado. They settled here in a house I had built for them nearby, where they raised my grandson, Wallace III. With my mercantile business under the care of Frank Sweet and Oscar Holland taking care of the bank, I was afforded some time in my late 60s to enjoy the fine life I had built for myself in Carbondale, Colorado. But it didn't last long as I developed cancer of the stomach when I was 70 years old. William Mansfield Dinkle died on April 23, 1918. He was given a full front page obituary calling him the daddy of Carbondale. Having been a member of the Carbondale Masonic Lodge number 82, he was given a proper Mason's burial in Hillcrest Cemetery and his grave capped with a magnificent granite slab. Sally sold the house in Carbondale and moved to Denver. She remarried and lived a lavish lifestyle until her death. Her son had her buried in the family plot on White Hill. Dinkle's leg legacy lives on in the former cornerstone of commerce, the Dinkle Building, and carried forward by his descendants. 
Inkle's great-granddaughter, Shelley DeBeck, has contributed much of the material used to complete this biographical history. <laughs>